To the Hartleys of Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest married couple in town. Well, the longest married, at least. <laughs> There's only one left. I tell you what, you know what we gotta do with these? We gotta throw them all overboard. Have a Santa Barbara tea party. What? Yeah, sure, they'd sink right down to the bottom just like a rock. No one would ever know about it, and we wouldn't have to worry about hiding them. Welcome to week 88 of Bisha and Diane Watch Santa Barbara. Hello. I'm wearing my Beatles t-shirt because we finished Get Back over the weekend, finally. I would suggest you watch it one day at a time like we did instead of an entire three hours. That means you will probably want to have Disney Plus for at least a few weeks. Mm hmm Yeah. Especially if you don't like uh, any of the songs on that album. <laughs> we finished episode 425, which originally aired Monday, March 31st, 1986. We're halfway between two sweeps periods, but things have been happening, really, this whole time. Gina realizes she doesn't have the tape recorder and returns to the car just as a guard comes out. She's unable to pull it from Kirk's grip. Uh, she tells the guard that she was just walking by and she heard uh, this guy leaning on his horn. So she manages to get out of there without being uh, roped in, but I think we now have a witness that places her at the scene, mm -hmm. even if Kirk doesn't, uh, you know, finger her as being the cause of her heart attack, his heart attack. Um, she then sends Haley into the hospital to get the recorder. And Haley watches through the window as Kirk flatlines. And we had two orderlies, a nurse and a doctor, trying to resuscitate him. And eventually the doctor jolts him back to life. After the team resuscitates Kirk, uh, they move him on to the next room. I don't know, I think maybe he went into surgery. And uh, Haley manages to grab the tape recorder from where the orderly put it on the sideboard. Angel is annoyed to find Haley in his apartment. Uh, <laughs> Gina introduces her as her niece. And uh, Gina erases, as usual, some incriminating parts of the tape. She likes to doctor these tapes that she then wants to use as evidence. She's the original content creator. <laughs> um... When Haley hears uh, what's on the tape, she snatches it from Gina and says, I'm turning this into the police right now, and you'll be free. Gina, not too happy about that. I don't know if she still had some manipulation to do, or I think she thought she could blackmail Kirk a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I think she mentioned that was one of her two options. <laughs> so she'll have to go with the having Kirk behind bars option. If he survives... Sam has a mustache. I don't think he had a mustache the last time we no, saw him. No, I don't think so. Maybe he was just trying to prove a point as to how long it's been since they last had some uh, episodes for, or some scenes for him to shoot. So uh, He watches Dylan bring in another box of Nick's books. And then Kelly arrives to say that Dylan stole them and she's come to take them back. Dylan suggests a Santa Barbara tea party. Throw them in the ocean. Uh, Dylan is obsessed with the fact that Kelly's been lying to Nick, although most of her lies are fairly meaningless. <laughs> he seems to think that the whole thing is just proof that they shouldn't be together and uh, that everything's going to blow up. He makes it sound like the most uh, <laughs> dastardly lies in the world, and it's basically just, you know, I bought your book. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's bizarre. Um, Kelly tells Nick that she wants to get married next week. I think this whole uh, situation was with Dylan, as we suspected, made her anxious, and uh, she just wants to get that wedding over with. So Nick and Kelly toast to long, happy years. Oh, I think I think it, we should mention that the the scene with Dylan that precedes this one with with Nick is kind of played out throughout the episode, and. Throughout this whole conversation, Kelly's basically trudging out with big boxes of books. So it's actually not kind of as romantically fiery as as it might sound from the, the summary. <laughs> uh, Nick gets a call. By the way, this uh, 
discussion about getting married next week is at Buzz's. Nick gets a call, and um, I think it's at Buzz's. They're in the same place as Dylan, so, yeah. Um, Dylan has shown up at Buzz's, too, by this point. Uh, and it's Eden, who we, once again, haven't really seen for a few days. And she wants Nick to come over and don't let Kelly know. So this was, um, I think this was related to her, you know, needing a private detective. I think, I think so, too. Because uh, she can't go to cruise. So uh, this is actually good, having Eden rope in Nick um, to this. So it's good to have someone outside of the family uh, maybe witness Kirk's behavior in case mm -hmm. things go haywire. Mm -hmm. Sam gets a call that number two roulette wheel has jammed up again. And this time, when he comes back, he's closed the casino, and he returns to Dylan's office to confront him with the control device. The same type you used in Algeria, he says to Dylan. And he found devices on all the wheels and several of the other machines, too. Probably the slot machines. Uh, Dylan is just annoyed that he closed down the casino and says, Oh, you know... You should be happy about this, because your share of this extra profit is going to be so, so big. Uh, Sam says he's tired of being treated like Dylan's valet. It's time he stopped bullying Kelly, and he's going to give Dylan only a three-minute head start. So I suspect uh, he's going to tell Cece or Kirk or Kelly or Eden that Dylan has um, rigged all the games. I hope so. And this just makes me relieved all over again, and we talked about this a few months back, that Dylan didn't go through with his plans of opening a, an illegal gold mine, because that would have, that would have been lives at risk um, if he was playing this kind of, of game with that sort of project. We uh, remember when Dylan first showed up with a map to some land that was in Africa, and we thought, mm -hmm. I don't think he can just claim someone's land. Well, this is the same. Uh, I guess we were right. It wasn't the writer's error. It was the fact that Dylan is a complete wacko. Yeah. Pearl tells Ted he heard about him storming out of the memorial service, and he says when he was young, he had an argument with his parents over what color shirt to wear to church. And he left thinking they would come and find him someday. And they never did. And he says he misses his parents. Mm. I mean, that must have been quite some time ago, because he looks like he's in his later 30s, I would say. Yeah. So, he's been gone for like 20 years. Ted tells Cece, if he's going to stay, things are going to have to change. He says, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to pay rent, and you're not going to order me around anymore. And Cece says, I still want to give you some fatherly advice. Ted says, that's okay, but I'm not taking any <laughs> orders. <laughs> Pearl seems to think that Madeline was meeting someone behind her husband's back at that uh, location that he took him. Uh, her and Madeline says, her marriage is great, and by the way, her husband is extremely handsome. Uh, so, we'll probably be seeing Mr. Laurent at some point. Mm -hmm. Then she tries to get Cece to fire Pearl for having Julia in her, in, uh, her car while, while he was waiting. Cece refuses. Madeline then tells Pearl that she'll make things so unpleasant for him that he'll want to quit. Uh, later, <laughs> Madeline has, not suspiciously, left a pearl necklace just lying around, which Pearl uh, looks at. Uh, Madeline, of course, was hoping that Pearl was going to steal it so she could get him fired, but she doesn't really know Pearl. So, when he doesn't seem to care about it that much, she slips it into the pocket of his jacket. So, who will Cece believe? Pearl or Madeline? And I'm also interested to see just where this ends up, not only in terms of Pearl's job and the whole thing with Cece and Madeline, but did it occur to me, is it even, are they even real pearls necessarily? Mm. Or, you know, could this perhaps shed some light on, on some of the activities um, that Madeline's engaging in without her really thinking through that it might, Mm. I don't know. That was just a, a mm. little thought I had because we know that um, Pearl actually is very learned and very, you know, he could uh, assess. Uh, oh, because he did paintings. look at them because yeah. they were pearls, and you know, he he had spent all those years trying to make, you know, 
and trying to collect pearls. So that's something that hadn't dawned on me. I, I thought he looked at them and then rejected them for, uh, for another reason. It didn't occur to me that, that they might be fake. Well, I, I think pearls are a little more honest than to just snatch someone's necklace. But it did occur to me that maybe they're they're not genuine. Maybe Madeline doesn't even know whether mm. they are or not. Is another thought I have. There had. could be some scheme going on that. I guess Pearl might put things together as he drives Madeline to various drop points or whatever. This was a possibility. I thought they might play a role, or we might they might be forgotten yeah. once this little. I have absolutely in. no memory of anything Madeline does, um, except for one very important thing. Uh, but that doesn't happen for several weeks, I think. So, um, yeah, I don't remember this part of Madeline's storyline at all. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if there actually is a whole thing. I mean, I would have been studying for finals at this point and might have been a bit distracted because I had skipped too many classes this semester. <laughs> um, eventually someone notices there is a river of water running down the stairs into the atrium from Eden's overflowing bathtub that has been running for hours now. Uh, Ted discovers that the whole upstairs is a pool of water. And Madeline complains to Cece about this leaky house. <laughs> it's not leaky, the tub's just running over. <laughs> what a, a great, great house guest. <laughs> um, it's around this time Cece gets a call that Kirk is in the hospital. And when he and Ted um, are met by the doctor, the doctor says that Kirk's heart is surprisingly weak. He must have had rheumatic fever as a kid. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting... We, you had said there was no indication anything would happen to Kirk. You were completely surprised by the heart attack and thought he was faking it, in yeah, fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's the thing. Um, that, you know, people forget about diseases from the olden days of 1985. <laughs> um, and then he says his heart is beyond repair. Mm -hmm. Cece asks, how long does he have? The doctor says Kirk Cranston has one week to live. Wow. What do you think is going to happen? Well, um, we know what happened when Peter Flint had an inoperable aneurysm and had weeks to live. He went off on a rampage and started killing people and then kidnapped Kelly. Um, I don't know with a heart problem if Kirk would have that kind of stamina, but um, I think that that definitely um, if he continues on for the next week or so with this problem, of course people who have um, sometimes have heart attacks also then have cognitive issues afterwards because oxygen deprived brain kind of thing. Um, so that might influence his behavior even more. I suppose it's also possible that um, there'll be a transplant situation and maybe his life will suddenly be, you know, he'll be, be off borrowed time for a little while. Whose heart do you think would be transplanted into Kirk? <laughs> it occurs to me we've been talking about a potential murder mystery for Dylan. What if Kirk gets Dylan's heart? Maybe. That's an interesting idea. Yeah just came to me earlier when we were watching Boba Fett for no reason. <laughs> well, we've been watching, because we like to watch old shows, we've been working our way through the second season of St. Elsewhere. Mm. And of course, just... they've got this whole storyline about heart transplant. Mm -hmm. With Nina and, and uh, Marion Mercer's character. So Eve. that would have been a thing. That would have been a possibility in the 80s. That you know, heart mm -hmm. transplants did happen. So yeah, I think they were still fairly new, though. I mean, uh, the St. Elsewhere we're watching is from around 1982, and I think it was the first transplant that Dr. Craig had ever performed. Um, I think we were watching some other show a while back from a little earlier on, and there was some, there was a transplant that was considered, you know, just a one of it, first of its kind operation. I think that might have been from one of our 70s shows, so we forget how, you know, how recently organ transplants have actually existed. The other thought I had, which is a much less happy thought for me, is that uh, 
Dylan will pursue Sam and, uh, you know, cause an accident or, or, or get Sam killed somehow. And then it could be. Yeah, Sam's I'm a bit worried for Sam here. I mean, maybe it's just part of getting Sam to be another suspect in, in the murder mystery. But yeah, it is a bit worrying how nasty Dylan has become to his former best friend. Yeah, well, and everyone really, and mm-hmm. how obsessive he is about Kelly. So that's another thought I had that for kind of lining up possible candidates for a, a heart transplant. Or it could be something completely off screen where it's like, oh, there was this accident, you know, on the freeway and we have a potential donor. That would be another possibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, we will see as we continue with week 88 and watch episode number 426, the April 1st episode. Maybe it's all an April Fool's joke. Maybe it'll all be a dream like the, was it the last season of Dallas or the one before? I never I watched know, Dallas. Uh, some some TV shows sometimes like to do a fake episode on April Fool's. We'll see. Maybe on April 2nd, the doctor will come out and say, he's got 20 years to live. We'll see uh, after we watch episode 426. See you then. Bye-bye. Hello. No, this isn't a Cranston resident. Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 426 of Santa Barbara, which originally aired Tuesday, April 1st, 1986. See if there's any April Fool's shenanigans going on. Pearl and Courtney decide to leave the hospital. Courtney explains that their parents always traveled and Madeline always stayed in her ivory tower. Pearl says he thinks Courtney has come down from hers. She says she's never met anyone like Pearl. So I guess his reverse Pygmalion worked very quickly. Mm-hmm. So I think Julia's going to be on her own soon. <laughs> Again. Well, she's ended up on her own a few times. We've uh, matched her with all kinds of people, but... Uh, Jack Stanfield Lee was the only one that stuck for any length of time. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think who she could end up with. I mean, in Dylan's single, but it's probably a bad choice. Well, we're Sam. hoping he'll be murdered soon. So. Ted says he's surprised Kirk was able to drive himself to the hospital. Uh, Haley says she's going to go back to the Capwell mansion, but she swings by angels and tells Gina that Kirk is going to die. Uh, Gina tries to say, oh, no, they always find a cure for these things, but... Uh, Haley says they, they're pretty adamant. He's only got a few days. Uh, later, Ted looks for Haley in her room. He ends up looking at some of the books that she has, which are uh, the same ones that he was uh, prescribed for his classes that semester. Mm-hmm. She looks. He looks at a framed photo of her and her prom date, uh, who was, I believe, briefly mentioned in a chat with Gina a few days ago. And uh, Haley... Sh- Uh, comes to her room at midnight and finds uh, Ted asleep in the armchair. (laughs) Now, um, the the set design was such that the windows kind of were against a sloped wall. So I think uh, Haley's room must be in... This, on the same floor as the attic that Kirk has visited in the past. Obviously, it's not the same room, unless they quickly cleared it out to uh, make room for Haley. So there must be some uh, rooms on an upper level uh, where the roof is sloped. Yeah, it must be under a garret of some some kind, um, the kind of space that you would expect to help to sleep in. Not a big grand bedroom, but a little nook under a sloped roof. Mm-hmm. It seems it's probably time for Ted and Haley to go out on a proper date at this point. Madeline tells Kelly that Kirk is dying. Um, and she says the pearls that her husband David gave her are missing. So now we know Mr. Laurent's first name is David. So, looking forward to meeting David Laurent at some point. Uh, Courtney calls the police. As you recall from last episode, Madeline had hidden the pearls in uh, Pearl's jacket, which he had actually left when he and Courtney ran to the hospital. Um, Madeline tells the police that, hmm, now that I think about it, Pearl, Pearl was the only other person who knew where those pearls were. Uh, Pearl and Courtney arrive, and Madeline says, There he is right now, the new butler I was telling you about. Um, Courtney, of course, uh, wants to be helpful and says, Oh, we should probably search your room just in case. You know, you mislaid them. So Courtney and Madeline go up to search her room. Uh, While the police are uh, somewhat distracted, he 
realizes that Madeline has slipped the pearls in his jacket pocket. And um, when uh, the suggestion uh, uh, um, is made to search Pearl, uh, it seems like Pearl is about to be found out because he's put the jacket on, but in fact, Pearl has palmed the uh, pearls and has them in his right hand, and he tosses them in one of the giant planters that are now in the atrium. So um, he uh, is clean after that sweep, uh, and then we see he's got the pearls back in his hand. And then um, I kind of lost track of where the pearls were and where Pearl was and where the police were, uh, Courtney, and, Courtney and Madeline come back, and Courtney, for some reason, says, Madeline, why don't you check your purse one more time? Now, I thought, well, this sounds very rehearsed, like as if she and Pearl had planned this, but there's no way they could have conversed this. So it seems like an odd suggestion. But anyway, guess what? That's where the pearls were. Pearl had somehow managed, in front of the two police officers, to slip those pearls into Madeline's purse and some other item that I didn't quite uh, see. It was like some little rubber something that caused Madeline to scream. And Pearl sidles up beside her and says, April Fool's sweetheart. I kind of got the impression that perhaps um, innocently Madeline is a habit of misplacing things because Courtney does say something like, oh, you're always, you know, we're always looking for your things. So I assumed that was why she suggested the purse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. So the police, uh, I don't think, have any negative suspicions of Pearl at all from this uh, encounter. Um, they think Madeline's a bit flaky, so they might be less than inclined to come again if there's a, a call from the Capwell Mansion about a supposed theft. Yeah, a little bit of Madeline goes a really long way. And uh, I think we're seeing just about every character on the show fed up with her after a very limited period of time with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see her interacting with maybe Augusta and, uh, oh, I guess at some point, Gina. Uh, at Buzz's, Sam starts to tell Kelly what Dylan is up to. And Dylan freaks out, as you uh, might imagine. Uh, but Kelly says she doesn't care anything about Nick, doesn't want to hear anything. Uh, sorry, Dylan. Uh, doesn't want to hear anything. And then Nick arrives, and before Sam can continue, Nick announces that he and Kelly are getting married the day after tomorrow. So that kind of derails Sam's attempts to tell Kelly, and in fact, he even uh, he even runs out to the car later to try and talk to her, um, but um, she still doesn't want to hear it. So when he comes back in, uh, Dylan says to Sam, okay, okay, I'll pay back all the money. And then Sam says, what do you mean? You were skimming the money <laughs> as well as cheating the customers? He thought that he was just inflating the profit. So, <laughs> so um, Sam is so angry uh, with Dylan, and, and he starts going, well, you know, that would never have worked because of the, the count, and Brick has to do the... And he goes, you were going to frame Brick for this whole <laughs> thing, weren't you? Kind of gets worse and worse. Because of his previous embezzlement issues. So anyway, Sam says, you know what? I'm going to either walk into Warren Lockridge's newspaper right now and tell him everything, or you're going to uh, sell all your shares, give me my part of the money, and leave town. So that is Sam's ultimatum for Dylan. So we might be seeing the end of Dylan after all without a murder mystery. Well, that would be nice. I think Dylan started signing something too, didn't he? Um, I like it. Dylan goes to the Capwell Mansion. Um... Not sure what he wants to do there. Maybe he's got one last scheme to sell. Oh, maybe he's he's going to try to sell sell the CC as Sam as Sam is uh, you know forcing him to. But uh, Kelly ends up uh, intercepting him and tells him to make an appointment and shuts the door. Uh, he says, "Don't worry, I'm not here to break up your wedding. You'll do that all by yourself." So he gets in a last little dig, even though he's his own grave has been dug at this point. And Haley has a new haircut. Now, I don't know if, uh, or did you have anything to say about Dylan? Um, I guess the only thing I would say about this scene and a little bit the situation with Gina, although Gina is Gina, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, but one of the things I always find sort of irritating about soap operas, which is part of the reason I'm not generally a huge fan of them, is that there's the way people behave in soap operas and the way people behave in real life. And... Uh, I think in real life, if someone is desperately trying to tell you something, 
most people will stop and listen. Mm, yeah. And I realize that this creates a plot point, but it just really irritates me when people don't behave in a normal way. Mm. Which I'm sure I'm going to be seeing a lot more as long as we're doing this podcast. But <laughs> just to get my little, you know, I, I tend to get kind of irritated by that. So I was irritated by Kelly this episode. Yeah, that is frustrating as a viewer. Because, I mean, they could write it in a way that it makes sense, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Haley has a new haircut. Now, I don't know if she had it yesterday, which when we uh, saw her helping Gina, but she's no longer... I uh, got the faux lichen, uh, and it seems to have some weird layers at the side, so I don't know if she could do the faux lichen anymore with it cut that way. Um, we'll call this one the Haley. Haley is unable to start Angel's car. As you'll recall, Haley had stolen uh, the tape uh, from Gina. Not stolen, snatched it, and said she was going to the police. Um, so Angel is easily able to bring her back into the motel room. Um, Angel, Angel wants to hear the tape. Um, but as he uh, tries to get it from Haley, she drops it, and then the player won't play anymore. So the tape is fine. It's just that Angel uh, can't hear it. So I'm not sure what they're. I'm not sure what they're up to with this tape. You'd think everyone would benefit from it just going to the police, but uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's another example of that. I was just really irritated. This episode honestly wasn't probably what she did as carefully as I should have because of that. But again, this is. A situation where obviously you would go to the police with it, it would clear everybody, but because people are acting stupid, it, that doesn't happen, and now the tape's broken. So. Yeah, I, I just this doesn't seem like the type of tape that should be in play for weeks, like some other tapes, like uh, Amanda Bishop or Miranda Bishop's tape on Another World in 1980. So I was actually having grown up in this era with an actual cassette tapes, they they were fairly fragile things, as I recall. You could only play them so many times. They would get kind of mucked up if you if you did the wrong thing mm -hmm. with them. So Sometimes a player would mangle it, so especially yeah. in this case, where they've now dropped the player, uh, hitting play is probably the worst thing you could do. You should probably just take it to the police and let them have their lab people play it back. You know, Every time it's handled, there's a risk of the only evidence going going haywire. Eden asks, Marsha, have we seen Marsha before? I don't recall. We've seen some, a few Capwell staff. Uh, but she asks Marsha if Kirk works late every Tuesday. And Marsha says that yes, he does. And then Eden says, was he working late that Tuesday I had my accident? And Marsha says, well, I know. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Eden asks Marsha about these microphones she found in Kirk's desk. Um, and uh, Marsha says, oh, he bought those for some conference uh, a few weeks ago. So that may be something that Kirk had bought for a conference and decided to repurpose for, uh, for uh, his boathouse uh, shenanigans um, that he had, you know, very quickly <laughs> set up, <laughs> uh, from what we could tell. Um, so Eden hires Nick to find out who bought the cables that she found in the boathouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but then she finally runs into Kelly, who had heard from Madeline that Kirk is in the hospital, and so Eden finally finds out that Kirk is in the hospital. Uh, he's in intensive care. The doctor tells Eden, really the only possible treatment for Nick is a heart transplant, which we talked about yesterday, but not to mention it to anyone yet. So he's thinking that, you know, that may be a long shot, probably has to run some tests and see if it's even an option. Um, but that's really the only hope that uh, Kirk has been given, as you suggested. You, you didn't think Kirk was leaving the show uh, quite so soon, so mm -hmm. uh, I think that may be where we are headed. Um, Nick arrives with news uh, of the uh, speaker wire. Um, he has done some research now. Just in general, I think if I showed up at a store with some speaker wire and said, hey, who bought this? They're like, Oh, um, 10 million people bought this, because all speaker wire is the same. But not only did Nick say there was only one store in town that sold it, but and then Eden cuts him off and says, you know what, it doesn't even matter anymore. So she, I think, is 100% under the impression Kirk will be dead soon, and that it doesn't matter. Uh, guess who sneaks into Kirk's room wearing her wig that we've been teased with for the last few days? It's Gina, dressed as a nurse with her wig. Um, 
Kirk tells Gina he's going to die. He says, it should have been you. I'm going to tell them everything. And so Gina starts eyeing his monitors, trying to remember how CC's worked. <laughs> he says, oh, I, I might just have to do the same thing to you as I did to CC. Now, I don't think they're quite in the same boat, I don't think. The monitors, uh, anything that's hooked up to Kirk is actually keeping them alive. But um, uh, maybe in a few days, if Kirk you know, loses consciousness or something, um, before he can get a heart, uh, Gina might have another opportunity to flick some switches. Uh, Eden uh, comes in, so Gina has to slink back out of the room, but um, after Eden has a brief chat with Kirk, she leaves and sees Gina from behind and seems to think that perhaps she looks familiar. Now, the thing is, I had, I had said, I think, uh, if Eden spots Gina, she might she might not immediately raise the alarm, because I think she's, you know, now really, truly convinced Gina was a victim, too, in this case. So, uh, it might not be bad for Gina if Eden corners her in the mm -hmm. chapel or in, in, in an empty room or something. And I think that is it. So, we'll wait for a murder victim to uh, get a heart for Kirk, and we'll... Uh, um, Wait for Ted and Haley to go on a date. And uh, we haven't heard about Lionel's art collection for a while. Or any of the Lockridge's, really. Yeah, Warren's paper is probably very close to bankruptcy. We haven't seen him even gambling for a while. We haven't seen Lionel for a while, Minx for a while. Oh well. And maybe Julia will get a date with someone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe David Laurent isn't quite as happy with Madeline <laughs> as, uh, as he thought. So uh, That is it for the April Fool's episode, and we did get an April Fool's reference. Uh, we'll be back after we watched episode 427. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. What sort of goings-on have you got going? Welcome back. Hello. We finished episode 427 of Santa Barbara, which originally aired Wednesday, April 2nd, 1986. Brandon's psychiatrist, Dr. Mills, suggests that CC tell Brandon that Gina is dead. Santana and Cruz decide to move in together. Gina phones the hospital, and the nurse accidentally confirms that Kirk is dying. Mm -hmm. The nurse brings Cruz and Eden a list of people Kirk wants to see. Eden, Cruz, CC, and Haley. Eden says maybe he wants to confess. Cece wonders why Haley has been invited. Ted wakes up to find that Haley is asleep in her bed. She is having a nightmare and calls out Gina. Mm. She asks why he was in her room, and he says he was worried about her last night and fell asleep waiting for her. Uh, then he asks about the books that she had, which were, you know, copies of all the books he had for school, and she said, well, I can't go to school yet, but I thought I'd get a head start. So I guess she's trying to earn some money, or maybe she just came at the wrong time of the semester. Yeah, and I think her um, also adopting the books that Ted is studying is a way for her to um, kind of establish a connection with him to, you know, she's a maid right now, maybe she's hoping to, to better herself, and I think she rather likes Ted, so I think she would like him to see her as being on the same sort of level as him. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosa calls Haley and says that Mr. Mr. Cranston wants to see her at the hospital. So she's freaking out, of course, thinking he will reveal everything. Uh, and uh, runs off before Ted can ask her what's going on. Haley runs to Gina and tells her and begs her to just bring the tape to the police. But Gina says there are some other things on that tape that uh, might get her into trouble. So Gina plans to leave town and suggests that Haley come with her. As Kirk is about to confess to the collected group, the doctor comes in and says he's a perfect candidate for a heart transplant because he's young and a whole bunch of other things line up perfectly. And they want him shipped up to Stanford immediately. And if his heart gives out while he's there uh, waiting for a donor, they have some machines that can keep him alive for an extra week or two. Mm. So this one-week death sentence is now a two- or three-week death sentence. Uh, but it sounds like Eden and... Kirk will be 
out of town for the next little while. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I don't know how. That'll give them time to kill off someone to provide the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, Kirk stares at Haley, as everyone is expectantly so waiting for him to make his pronouncement. And he says, there'll be plenty of time for talking when I'm back on my feet again. So I don't know if Kirk is uh, being overly... Uh, ambitious, thinking he'll come through this heart transplant with flying colors if they do find a heart for him. But I think he wants to play his cards close to his vest again. Yeah, he's still the manipulative Kirk that we've come to know. Mm -hmm. Not love, but no. Eden tells Cruz that she's going up to Stanford with Kirk. Haley runs to tell Gina what happened. So there's a lot of back and forth to Angel's place from Haley. Uh, Gina's not there, and as she's writing a note, Angel comes out in a towel, and it's clear he uh, is interested in Haley and is disappointed when she doesn't want to just hang out. Ted has written a short story, which he reads to Courtney. Courtney envisions herself, Pearl, and Madeline in the story. Uh, It's a romantic story, so it's clear that Courtney is maybe having some romantic feelings about Pearl now, too. Ted gives Haley a bunch of books and the short story to read. Haley says she loves the story but wishes it had a happy ending. Ted tries to kiss Haley, but Haley stops him, saying, Rosa's already warned her. And then, uh, as usual, they have the type of Ted discussion that you would imagine. Ted says, I don't see you as a maid. And and then uh, quickly tries to figure out a way to solve the problem by saying, you can get another job. (laughs) So... uh, I think he's already thinking of having a relationship with with Haley, even though she hasn't even uh, really responded anything Mm -hmm. but negatively at this point. But it's soap opera love. Um, Gina phones, and Haley tells her not to leave town, as Kirk didn't say anything. She tells Gina about the heart transplant. Gina says, they'll have to find him the heart of a viper. That's the only kind his body wouldn't reject. So that could be foreshadowing for Dylan. Um, yeah, the, those writers are clever. Madeline interrupts Pearl's flirting with Courtney to order him to drive her back to the bungalow she's been frequenting. Pearl asks her, what sorts of goings-on have you got going? <laughs> Pearl listens to some Shakespeare on cassette while waiting. And then the call comes in from C.C. Capwell, ordering him to immediately pick up Brandon from the mansion and to bring him to Santana's house. Now, isn't Brandon already living with Santana? I thought so. I mean, there's no reason he wouldn't be at the Capwell mansion Mm -hmm. visiting. So, Um, when he finishes, Courtney has tagged along for the ride back to pick up Madeline. And uh, Courtney spots someone she thinks she recognizes. And says, no, it couldn't be. So, this is interesting. I bet it could. (laughs) So, whoever Madeline's been seeing at the bungalow is someone Courtney recognizes. Now, could it be David? Is David actually secretly already in town? Uh, In which case, why is he hiding? Unless it's part of this, you know, theoretical scheme we think that maybe something's going on with Grant. Maybe... Ted Laurent is uh, employed at Grant Capwell Enterprises, just like Peter Flint was, Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Uh, Pearl takes the opportunity to ask Courtney if she wants kids, and she says it may not happen until she's 40. Then Madeline gets in and is livid to see that, since Courtney's there, Pearl clearly didn't wait for her the entire time as she had ordered. Mm. Uh, But he uh, says, Mr. Capwell uh, ordered me to leave. And then he also notes that she is missing the black pantyhose that she was wearing when she went in. She tells him to shut up, and he says, May I call you Matt for short? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who Madeline has been secretly seeing. Yeah, I think Pearl is turning out to be a little bit more observant than she might have hoped. Mm hmm. But she seems to, like, blow off these bits of evidence as if they somehow are going to vanish just because mm-hmm. she doesn't want to hear them. Gina overhears Courtney tell Ted that Cece is going to tell Brandon that Gina is dead. Cece tells Brandon that Gina has been sick and is now up in heaven. So, 
he kind of, at one point, I just thought he was going to say she went out of town because he was, it took a little while to get there. Oh, she's been sick. She's been in the hospital. She's, she's gone away now. And Come I thought, to a farm. <laughs> and then he says, he's in heaven. Uh, Santana and Cruz talk about moving to the beach house. Um, so Brandon is, of course, at Santana's at this point, and he packs some of his things inside the body of his stuffed bear, the same place Gina had previously used as a hiding place, and he sneaks out the window. So I doubt that Brandon thinks he's going to walk to heaven to <laughs> visit Gina, but he clearly, uh, has some sort of plan that was, tr I assume, triggered by being told that his mother is dead. Yeah. I can't imagine who he would uh, be trying to go to see. Mason, maybe? I thought maybe Mason or possibly Lionel. Mm. Mm hmm Or even Sophia. Mm hmm But yeah, be interesting to see where he goes and if they uh, find him missing and have a manhunt. Or if Gina maybe fortuitously runs into him out in the uh, backyard as she has been skulking around various places this episode to see what's what's going on at the mansion. Uh, maybe she'll just take him away uh, somewhere, as she has yeah. tried to several times in the past. Or was that Santana? <laughs> and <laughs> they both have. Use his attempt to run away later as ammunition to get back custody. Perhaps. Oh, that's true. That's true. I should point out that Gina is in her Spanish lady disguise throughout this episode. And that is it for this episode. And we have some credits. All of the main cast is the same, so no one's been fired yet. No potential heart transplant uh, victims. Uh, and we have four guest cast. Dr. Mills, played by Terrence McNally. That's Brandon's psychiatrist. First nurse, Nancy Pretty. She's the one who spilled a little too much to Gina, no matter how hard she tried. Uh, Kirk's doctor is Scott Stevenson. And, of course, Angel is Bernard White. And uh, whoever uploaded this to... Uh, added a little bonus to this episode. It had some bloopers, which presumably aired on something like uh, uh, Dick Clark's Bloopers and Practical Jokes. Uh, I know uh, that was an NBC show, and they tended to have bloopers from NBC shows on that on that show. So I imagine that's where this came from, and it was it was the scene of uh, Kirk in the hospital um, that ends with him saying that uh, there's time enough for talking um, after. I'm up on my feet, and he throws in something like, I forget what did he say, I'm going to Disneyland? Something going like to that. Hawaii. I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs> uh, it wasn't super funny, and it was definitely uh, a long preamble to get to there. But. I kept thinking as I was watching it, I remember the cast when we went on the cruise talking about how with soap operas, it's, it's very you know, chop, 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 get it done, because the timelines are so are so compressed and they generally run on a shoestring so they wouldn't want to waste a lot of time and I don't know if this would be on film or whatever but they wouldn't want to waste a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. so. It was the last line or after the last line yeah. of the scene so, scene so maybe he justified that. Plus, yeah. Uh, he knew his time on the show was limited so he probably thought he wanted to get away with one or two things before he leaves. Well and we saw um, we actually saw a taping of um, some shows when we were in Los Angeles a while back, one of which was the original run of Fraser, Fraser. And um, it's really interesting how the actors are trained. If they screw up a line, they immediately say it again, and it'll be edited in later so they don't waste any time or resources. Mm -hmm. We saw a 22 or 24-minute episode of Fraser shot in an hour. Uh, now, there was one scene played in um, from uh, uh, a previously recorded segment. They had a guest actor uh, who only appeared in an exterior that had been shot earlier, so that, that would have saved a little time to play that in. Um, but I don't think they did a second take of some of the scenes they did. No. They had one take, and they've got a dog on that show. And our guest actor was Alan Cumming, and he was in the audience with us, uh, even though he had no uh, scenes in the in the studio bound um, section of the program. He uh, showed up on the day uh, to support the rest of the cast, and it was great to see him in the audience. He was introduced by the warm up man, so 
And I, I think it's worth noting that on a fro show like Frasier, for example, and on, on most soap operas, a lot of the actors are actually stage actors. So they're used to having to, to do it once and do it right or find a way to quickly recover if they do mess up. So Now that Frasier thing uh, is contrasted by our attendance of a taping of the I think it was the final season of the Drew Carey show. I think it was uh, an episode surrounding a karaoke contest. And we were in that seat for, I think, five hours. And they ran out of uh, goodies to uh, give us. It felt like eight. I think they ordered us pizza. They brought us water. Um, and I think Mr. Drew Carey was responsible for most of the flood lines. I could see Sam Simon, who was directing, just, you know. Staring up at the and all sky the other after every trained up, actors just, were pretty uh, impatient too. I think that well, yeah. was towards the end of the the run, and that was that weird year where it got like a two or three year renewal from ABC, and then literally, I guess the ratings started following in that first year. So they were doing a year that they were being paid for that ABC probably didn't really even want anymore, but they were contracted to uh, to air, um, although. Nicholas Coster said, you know, a network would just eat the cost if they really didn't want to air a show like that. Um, the other show, well, I've seen a couple of other shows taped, but the other notable one was Friends in about 97, I think. And um, uh, the way it was, it was billed or presented when I got the tickets was that there would be two, uh, two showings. Like they would read it. What I understood was that there was a... Um, you know, a one o'clock seating and a four o'clock seating. And I assume they would do the show once at one and then do it again at four. Um, I think this was the very first show I ever saw taped, so I didn't, didn't know that they would just do the same scene over and over again. I thought they would run it all the way through and then do a whole nother run through. Um, so I dutifully got there at one and uh, turns out... Uh, no, no, no. Was that, no, I was signed up for the four because the one was sold out. And it turns out that is not how they do it. They actually started at one. And the four o'clock time is to fill in the audience members who, after three hours, have gotten bored and left. Because, mm -hmm. you know, some of these are relatives of network executives, and they're not as invested as someone who's flown in from Vancouver to L.A. So um, instead of letting everyone in who was in that four o'clock line, they let in one, and then two, and then four, and then one. And so it must have been about 6 p.m. that I got into that Friends taping, five hours into the taping. And uh, they were less than halfway through filming the episode. I saw a good, I would say, five-eighths of that episode being filmed. We got out of there at midnight. Um, and it was just because they would rewrite the scenes after doing a take. They would punch up the jokes and modify the, 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 the ending line of the scene to just to get it perfect. Because that was season, I don't know, probably five or six of the show. And... Uh, and they were, you know, the number one thing on NBC. And then they said, okay, we're sending the audience home now because we've got some more stuff to film without an audience. So they oh. must have gotten out of there at 2 a.m. Maybe they had some, like, street scene or something to do. And, uh, yeah, that was like a 12-hour taping for a half-hour show, but not because of screw-ups, just because they were trying to make a perfect product. They all have their own process. Mm -hmm. but, uh, definitely the Frasier experience was in my opinion, the most professional mm -hmm. and uh, certainly the most welcoming. You know, Kelsey Grammer came out and we got hot chocolate and everything. Um, uh, but I imagine in some ways it's probably the most similar to what a soap opera experience would be like just in the the allocation of time and resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you hear about Days of Our Lives doing sometimes two and a half uh, scripts uh, per day, I think it is now, like... Mm -hmm. That's two and a half hours shooting. Um, they they scrapped rehearsal time, at least official, obviously. The actors can rehearse during their own time if they can find some. But I doubt that there's a second take unless something goes really horribly wrong. Um, some sort of bloopers. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that is it for our April 2nd episode. Uh, that was a Tuesday. We'll, oh, it says here Wednesday. Uh, we'll be back after we watch episode 428. We may be in different cities when we do that. We 
recording. Bye. Bye bye. My God, they'll have to find him the heart of a viper. That's the only kind his body wouldn't reject. Sooner I pay in full, the sooner I get legal possession. I want uncontested ownership. <laughs> That's seven digits, Dad. Six of them zeros. I know the cost, Mason. I don't think there'll be any question about your ownership, Dad. Few people, if any, would be willing to pay what you're paying for a few thousand dollars worth of forgeries. <laughs> Welcome back. We finished episode 428 of Santa Barbara, which originally aired uh, Thursday, April 3rd, 1986. I guess I should stare at the camera and not at my own face. Lionel's artwork fills the Capwell Atrium. Uh, so we got a glimpse of some of uh, these uh, many paintings that Elizabeth did. Uh, or Mace, Mason reminds Cece that the check should be seven figures. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cece goes to get his checkbook and says, not everyone would, would pay this much for these. And uh, after he leaves, Mason says, yeah, considering they're only worth a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, every time Mary calls the hospital to check on Mark, she founds out, finds out that he lied about being at the hospital. Um, so during one of her many glum scenes today, Mason asks her to an early dinner, or it was it a late lunch that could become a dinner? Mm -hmm. And she agrees. And of course, they <laughs> end up going to Buzz's. Um, Mark gets upset with Mary for constantly checking up on him. And uh, next thing you know, he's hitting on Bobby, the uh, roulette dealer or blackjack dealer that we've previously met at uh, Nick's place. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, I've been known to supplement my income with a little fun for profit. And he says, oh, she says, if I'm in the mood. And he says, I feel a certain mood coming on right now. So... Could this be the end of Mark's problem? They go to a hotel, only for Mark's problem to put a damper on things. And uh, he decides he doesn't need to pay since nothing happened. And the argument was his fault, really. <laughs> I know, he right? He was willing to dress up and do whatever. Yeah, that's right. He said, oh, people, she said something. Oh, I have costumes in this, you know, room or something. So I guess she goes there all the time. And... Uh, uh, he says, oh, people really want you to dress up. And she said, yeah, sometimes uh, they want me to dress like a nun. <laughs> and Mark says, well, I don't want anything like that. That doesn't help. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, their argument over payment escalates, and it ends up with Mark hitting Bobby. Yeah, so he's really going into Peter Flint territory now. Yeah, they, we, here we got real Peter Flint vibes from Mark uh, this episode. He didn't get his own eerie music, but still. Uh, that's true. That's true. I have to say, Bobby, um, at first glance, looks a little bit like Janice. So I would say Mark I know. has a type, and that type isn't Mary, actually. So. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, because thanks to the VHS and the age and the digitization, uh, when the camera panned over across the bar, as Mark was approaching her, um, she had her back to the camera. And for a second, I thought it was Janice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think they, they looked, uh, made her look a lot like Janice. Um, anyway, Bobby uh, knows Ginger. And Ginger suggests that Mason could help her. And she goes to Mason and says, I want to press charges against this guy. Now, she yeah. doesn't know, she doesn't know his, he's Mark. But, you know, before Mark left, she said, hey, I know you hang around buzzes and I know you go to Nick's. I'm sure I can find someone who knows who you are. Yeah, I feel like um, this could could really um, put put Mark in a bit of a difficult situation if uh, Mason manages to identify him. And of course, Mason's a lawyer, but uh, Mason also could use this as, as a little bit of leverage with Mary to uh, maybe get her out of the marriage eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a possibility. Because Mary's not happy, I mean, you know, she's still checking on Mark. He's still not telling her the truth. And she knows he's not telling her the truth. So mm -hmm. she's been sullen in every scene we've seen her in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, Ginger, uh, 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 she says that she wants to uh, press charges against Mark and uh, Mary sitting with Mace at the time and says, oh, yeah, whoever did this to you should definitely pay. Yeah. Uh, later, Mark finds Mary in the gazebo. This gazebo is being dressed up for Kelly and Nick's wedding tomorrow. And uh, Mason found her in the gazebo earlier. Uh, she says, oh, I just love this place. And then Mark finds her later and uh, says, oh, do you want an early dinner? And she agrees. I'm thinking. We just had a late lunch, early dinner with Mason, and I'm having another earlier dinner with uh, Mark. So, yeah, I don't think this is, I don't think this marriage is going to get better. <laughs> well, it hasn't really been consummated yet. I mean, it could be, it could be annulled at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nick. Is writing his wedding vows at the table at Buzz's. <laughs> uh, Dylan suddenly pops up and asks if he's working on his next book. He's like Puck running around. Uh, Sam tells Dylan, Hey, why didn't you sell your shares to Cece last night? So he says, You have to do it by the end of the day, or I'm going straight to Warren Lockridge. Um, Kelly sees Nick writing his vows and tells Nick she's sorry and runs home. <laughs> uh, when she gets home, Dylan is already there for his meeting to Cece. He's actually not in the room, and and uh, Kelly and Cece have a one or two sentences before Dylan pops up out of nowhere, much to Kelly's annoyance. Um, Cece asks Dylan why he didn't choose to sell to Lionel, and Dylan says, "Well, I just think because because we're two of a kind." <laughs> and Cece's like, "We are not. <laughs> I am going to <laughs> go get that check while we." while we're on the same page. So uh, this gives Dylan the opportunity to run to the car and get Kelly her wedding gift, which she does not want anything to do with. And it is a hundred year old brooch, which happens to be inscribed to Kelly on her wedding day. And he has this whole tale about Kelly, someone or other, some Irish girl that it belonged to. I wouldn't be surprised if Dylan just, you know, inscribed it himself really made yeah. up that old story. And I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't an antique either. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nick arrives and uh, says, ooh, that's lovely. Who's that from? And Kelly lies and says, oh, it's from Brick and Amy. Um, Dylan's standing right there, of course. And uh, Nick says, well, you should wear it tomorrow at the ceremony. I'm like, how's Kelly going to get out of this lie? Because A, Nick might, even if she doesn't wear it, Nick might mention to Brick and Amy. And B, another gift is going to arrive from Brick and Amy. Yeah. So, um, that was an odd lie. Uh, and she should have just said, oh, it's from Dylan. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know quite why she lied about it. I think I think she, she knew that um, Nick would be really upset if he thought that Dylan was giving her expensive gifts. I think, mm -hmm. like, that's all I can, like, think is that she just didn't want to set Nick and Dylan off on another thing. Hmm. I didn't know if it was necessarily expensive. But yeah, just... she, it's been sold as, a, I mean, it's been sold in the giving to her. It's been sold as an expensive thing. He's, Dylan's made it, make it, made it sound expensive and, hmm. you know, Precious. sort of fraught with all this value. So then later, Callie tells Nick she's not as perfect as he seems to think. This is another one of these backwards and forwards hemming and hawing things that dragged through several scenes that consolidated into one short sentence. But really it's like Kelly's almost backing out in a way, yeah, but Nick keeps saying, oh, I like you the way you are, et cetera, et cetera. So. I'm really feeling at this point, like Kelly doesn't actually like either of the Hartley brothers that much. Mm. I mean, she certainly put off by Dylan, she may still, for some reason, have um, a sexual attraction to him. I don't know. Every once in a while, we get a little bit of that vibe, although not mm -hmm. not that often really anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think she is actually that attracted to Nick, or really not attracted enough to feel she necessarily wants to spend the rest of her life committed to him. Really. Mm. But she's kind of stuck between the two of them. 
which is yeah. why I'm saying it would be kind of nice. Actually, I think if she could leave them both, you know, just to fight their battles with each other and, and go and find someone else or do something else. Cece seems to be pretty happy with Nick. I think he realizes that it'd be a very stable choice for Kelly and it's not going to trigger oh, yeah. any of the drama that she's had in the past, even if he's not, you know, all of the things that Peter Flint was <laughs> in Cece's eyes. I think he's just I fine. think Nick is definitely the, the better choice, obviously. But mm -hmm. I just don't think Kelly finds him that exciting, really stimulating not like joe he's not joe mm -hmm. um mason's room is being cleared so nick can sleep there tonight so he's it's being cleared of nick of uh kirk's things because kirk is now up at stanford and uh you know they don't want to sleep together the night before the wedding so nick is going to stay in mason's old room and i'm assuming that um eden has recovered now or recovered enough to not need mary Mm. Well, Mary even said she's going to Stanford with Kirk. And yeah, I guess if Mary's not going with her, what is Mary doing? Just living in the guest house? Oh, yeah. I guess Cece still needs some help, right? I Not guess a, so. I don't know. It's, just, for a while. It's, it's sort of hard when you watch these to think about what the timeline is in the, in the soap opera. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like it had all happened within like the last couple of days. So I yeah. Know, if it that's feel like a that. big turnaround, it seems like it's unlikely Eden is fully recovered, but maybe the timeline is actually a bit more extensive than that. I don't know. Hmm. I think there was one thing one day recently where I thought, oh, this could be days later. But then there was one scene that was right after the last one. Of, you know, I forget which character. I thought, well, that drags the whole thing back to the same day. Yeah. So. Um, Kelly asks Cece to invite Sophia to the wedding and uh, Sophia does and they end up re reminiscing about another wedding they attended now it may have been well been their wedding it wasn't clear from the dialogue but they had an enjoyable time at a wedding at some point Dylan phones Kelly <laughs> to remind her of all the lies they are keeping from Nick including these new ones and then Dylan bets Sam that Nick and Kelly won't get married tomorrow which side of that bet are you on? Um, it depends on what Nick ha or what Dylan has up his sleeve. You know, if he pulls something like he did, um, a, well, it was probably a month ago where he got Kelly into a situation where she needed to accept a helicopter ride from him. No. And he ended up <laughs> Takes taking her, away. her all the way up the coast. He very well could take off with her and not, mm -hmm. you know, she might miss her wedding for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that she, you know, we saw today she couldn't really um, face even writing the vows. It is possible that she will falter when she gets to the altar and just can't, can't quite say I do. Um, there is also, of course, the standard soap opera thing that weddings have that most of the real weddings I've been to haven't where they ask if anyone objects and I suppose Dylan could create enough of a scene mm -hmm. that, uh, you know and drive enough of a wedge by revealing about Kelly buying all of Nick's books etc cetera, etc cetera, that perhaps he he manages to throw off the wedding mm -hmm. I feel like at some point that's going to be revealed to Nick one thought I did have just now is maybe Kelly just won't show up at the church and she'll, be, she'll have gone to New York. <laughs> Which I kind of to... am more and more sympathetic to that, that plan, actually. I mean, I know at the time we talked a lot about her running away from, from her troubles and that, but I can kind of see the logic in it now. So I, that is possible, too. I think we'll see a heart-to-heart -heart with Eden or someone or Rosa you know, as she's getting ready and then something will put a, Sophia. a bug in her head. Um, and she'll, uh, you know, if we don't see that, then maybe it'll be the other thing of Nick spoiling it or Nick getting told about the books. But I, the think, um, yeah. I think one thing, you know, and I don't know if this will play in at all to Kirk's transplant story. I mean, we've had all sorts of speculation between the two of us about 
who might contribute a heart to Kirk. Um, but all of these de various things do give Kirk and Eden a bit more time in, in Stanford. Like it was, I think it was quite clever of them to say, well, even if a heart doesn't come right away, we can still keep them alive. Mm. So that gives them, you know, possibly three weeks of sort of buffer to, to put together whatever they need to put together too. Mm -hmm. They might even, <laughs> it might even be Marcy Walker's got a vacation coming or something. Yeah, yeah. Not that way too. So we might not see a heart to heart with Eden, Kelly. Eden might not show up to the wedding, especially if, you know, in soap operas, you always know a wedding's not going to happen when none of the family shows up uh, right. because they're not going to pay money for all those actors to sit in the church for a non-wedding. Um, it's only when everyone shows up and people who have long left the show show up uh, and, you know, the, the church is super dressed that, you know, the wedding's going to go through. Wedding in a gazebo, very <laughs> dodgy chances of it being one they're going to want to flash back to many years from now as Kelly and Nick and the kids reminisce. So it's probably, it's got some negatives going from it, just from a narrative, you know, just from a production standpoint. That we might not have and again, one. well, and I guess you could argue this either way. We've already had one full on wedding that didn't happen with, with uh, Mason and Santana. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. followed up by a very small one that did so um would they want to have another you know failed wedding so quickly failed wedding so quickly well we had a successful mark and mary wedding <laughs> so yes. that balance is out <laughs> and we did have a successful, successful crew in santana we did santana wedding so maybe yeah, that too good to one best yeah so yeah i mean from a plot point of view do they want to have two failed Capwell weddings in a row. Mm -hmm. Then again, as you said, you know they've already gone to the expense of one failed one. Mm -hmm. Not seeing a lot of expense being put into this next one. So I don't think we'll see Lincoln's wedding. Have they blown their wedding budget? In other words, on Mason's failed wedding. Well, you know, you're not going to do a soap opera digest photo shoot for a wedding. That's not going to go off. So, you know you're going to use the cheap set and just dress it for the day. So uh, the other thing about Dylan that was mentioned casually, I don't know if it's important or if it will end up causing problems, but Dylan briefly mentioned uh, if he, I think he just asked if CC still wanted him to work at the casino and uh, CC said, well, you can finish, uh, you can finish out as manager for today and mm -hmm. we'll see about tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. okay, what can Dylan do in half a day to completely blow blow things up, you know? So, I mean, now yeah. he's no longer the owner. He's got his cash, but he could still mess things up for a lot of cast members in his half day at, at the casino. Yeah, there's actually a lot of, of ways to think about that because, as we know, um, we, we know he's been playing around with the roulette tables, you know, with his little digital gadget thing. Mm -hmm. um, would there be any other physical evidence that he can't easily remove of his, you know, of his, of his devious deeds, you know? Mm. Would it be in his interest to actually blow up the casino? Yeah, I can't think of anything, but um, I don't know, pretty much, I mean, there was still fraud committed, right? He did still yeah. skim money off. That's possibly documented somewhere. And he still, whatever he was planning to do to frame brick, the numbers will still kind of all point in that direction. So. Yeah, I mean, as you say, there's still a lot he could do to cover his own tracks. And mm -hmm. if not literally blow things up because neither of us can quite come up with a reason why he would go that far. But you know, he could definitely perhaps cover his tracks by throwing blame on brick. He mm -hmm. could um, maybe do something nefarious, of course, to Kelly and Nick's wedding. Um, so maybe, maybe all the books are in his office and yeah, he'll start a fire or something in his office just to get rid of the books. So it'll look like a 
electrical fire that they've kind of foreshadowed for so long. Plus, I don't know, and maybe there was some mention of this when they were setting up the casino. I can't remember. The big thing was that it was in international waters. I don't know if there would be any kind of insurance on the thing and whether, you know, that could be part of a fraud he could collect on in some way either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know. And we we know we still don't know what CeCe's plan for the casino is and why there was no. this deadline. So there may be a surprise from that end too. I don't, yeah. I don't remember at all. So. But I'm sure he will make trouble on his way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both for Kelly and the casino. And maybe and in Sam and way, yeah, and Sam. Maybe this will have a direct impact um, with one of these characters, or maybe collateral if he does um, actually do some physical damage. But I feel like there is a heart coming out of this, perhaps somehow. We will see. Cruz and Santana find that Brandon is missing. They put out an APB. At Buzz's, Cruz tells Mason about Brandon. And Gina, in disguise, overhears. Yes, she's still in her senorita disguise, but with glasses on. So she can sit right at the next table reading a menu. And no one recognizes her. Now, she's not doing too good with her Spanish, though. It must be said. Mm. Well, she did show, actually shock, shock me because she said uh, the waiter came up to her and she says, no, I'm laying place or something. And then he responds in Spanish, and then uh, she actually replies in Spanish. So I was like, she. It didn't, I mean, but I don't. It was clear that it she's didn't not really Spanish. Really Spanish, but yeah. So yeah, but she manages uh, to spend the episode in her disguise, not getting recognized by anyone. And the only person who half recognized her even is in a different city. So. Um, Brandon heads for a bench that he and Gina once had a picnic at. I think this was maybe newly shot footage for his flashback to the picnic, because mm -hmm. I don't recall a picnic on a bench before. It's actually quite a big, big set, or maybe there's a backdrop, back cloth that makes it look bigger, but it's a bench uh, right at the edge of a forest, and they had a bunch of trees there, so I thought it looked pretty good on an old VHS that had been digitized. <laughs> um, it was a very sweet scene, actually, mm -hmm. between Gina and Brandon, and you can actually see the connection between them. And you can you can see, I, I felt like seeing that scene between Brandon and Gina, he does definitely seem much more bonded to Gina than he is to Santana, say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because he... He just left Santana very easily in the last episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Gina finds Brandon and just places an anonymous call. Oh, I heard there was a kid, you know, you were looking for. Uh, she waits in the forest to see what happens. Um, at some point, a very angry bum shows up to kick Brandon off his bench. And at the very end, it looked like he was fighting Brandon, but I think he just tripped or something. But Gina yeah, didn't. Kind of a wino. Yeah, but Gina didn't uh, dart out of the trees, so I guess she saw Brandon was okay, and then Cruz showed up. And uh, Brandon asked Cruz why Gina had to die, and Cruz said that sometimes God takes people we aren't ready to say goodbye to. That's what happened with my friend Joe. It was nice to have a Joe and a Ginger reference in this episode. It was, it was. So I guess Brandon will come back. And really now there's not much urgency now for Gina to reveal herself. So this could go on for a while. Mm -hmm. um, she may wait out the results of Kirk's transplant to see, you know, if he's back in full form. And then now she's got the confession, right? So I think she, if he recovers and, and comes back to Santa Barbara, she now might use that to try to blackmail him. And we don't know what, kind of condition Kirk will come back in like it's a soap opera. He could mm -hmm. have amnesia. Could, oh, that's true too, yeah. You know, he could, or he could just, you know, that's another one, like if he's been unconscious for a long time, which we would expect him to be with his various issues, it could be a little bit like CC where he only remembers certain things for a while, you know? Mm -hmm. So that could draw the tension a bit. 
he could come back less crazy. Or more crazy. Or more crazy. We will see when we watch episode 429 of Santa Barbara. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Don't let the decor fool you. This is a class operation. Well, I hate to leave you, but I've got to get going. My uh, sister's getting married. I have to run down to the little brown church in the Vale. Which sister? Uh, Kelly, the younger one. Again, <laughs> we married the older one off a short while back. Well, have fun. At a wedding. The worst in funeral. Welcome back. Hello. We've watched episode 429 of Santa Barbara. Originally aired Friday, April 4th, 1986. So we've reached the end of a week, and uh, we're into April, which is the month that precedes the sweeps. So presumably um, things will ramp up uh, as May approaches. At Buzzes, Bobby describes Mark to Mason, and uh, he says, oh, this should be enough to try and find this guy. Um, she tells him she doesn't want the police involved, and then uh, Mason says, well, I better get going. My sister's getting married. Uh, and Bobby asks, which one? And she says, well, we got rid of Eden already. It's Kelly this time. Yeah, I like that line. Bobby says, have fun. And Mason says, at a wedding, they're worse than funerals. I agree. Uh, Brick and Amy come to the Capwell mansion to see if they can help out with the wedding. And uh, Amy gets sent down to the gazebo and Cece offers Brick the casino manager job that Dylan has vacated. Um, so uh, that... Uh, it's not something that Brick uh, says no to. He does ask a little bit about why me? Is this to get back in Lionel? But in the end, it's not really that important to whether or not he takes the job. I think he realizes from his uh, past job search that even though his name has been cleared, it's one of those things where once people get an idea about you in their heads, it, it is hard to get past it. And I think he Ooh. realizes it might be actually quite difficult perhaps even now to get another job. Mm -hmm. CC also hangs up his newly purchased paintings. So there's a lot still strewn around on the floor, but he's hanging them up on the red walls uh, alongside the um, dining room and uh, living room. And uh, Mason says he's probably got a few in the bathroom as well <laughs> <laughs> in these stables. Um, CC calls Lionel and Augusta both to come over at noon. Uh, CC tells Lionel he's hired Brick, and Lionel says, "Oh, you should have consulted with me on that. I am, uh, you know, an equal shareholder." And CC says, "Oh, that's the other thing I was going to tell you. I bought all of Dylan's shares. I now have the majority, and uh, the casino is mine to control as I please." Mm -hmm. So I don't know if uh, that necessarily really is going to be a problem for Lionel. I mean. Uh, emotionally perhaps but i can't see that causing any, any issues unless cc's plan is to radically change something about the casino that would definitely uh rankle lionel so we'll see cc might want to turn it back into an oil rig i don't know and that's when lionel spots his paintings <laughs> <laughs> and realizes that augusta has sold them to cc and uh, Augusta arrives, and she's angry with Mason for having sold them to Cece, because she had said that's the one person she didn't want to sell them to, which is uh, not in a conversation I necessarily remember them having. But, uh, no, although I, I do remember, I mean, there's always ongoing tension between Augusta and Cece. So. Mm -hmm. And Lionel uh, pulls Mason into a corner and says, uh, well, you know, you, you should have given me a chance to outbid you know because i would have been higher and uh, mason reveals that he he knew that guy was a, a, uh an art uh, that art dealer was not above board uh which kind of flusters lionel a little bit and then uh mason says that uh i couldn't have really accepted another bidder uh to which lionel realizes means that cc was offering mason a finder's fee and so we kind of had to sell cc to get that double dip on the fee because I guess of course, paid him 10% uh, as well. So uh, Lionel's of course a little bit freaked out until 
Uh, Mason lets it be known that he knows the paintings are fake. And uh, I guess quickly puts together that both he and Mason are now in the same boat if the paintings ever get uh, discovered. And uh, by the time Mason ushers Lionel out the door, Mason and Lionel are having a good laugh about CC. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should mention too the other little surprise that CC springs on Lionel during this meeting is the fact that he has just hired Brick to be the manager of the casino. Ah, yes, I forgot about that. You know, that actually discombobulates Lionel a little bit. And I think it makes Brick a little suspicious that, you know, he was just offered this job to, you know, sort of. Uh, screw Lionel over a little bit, or at least kind of rub his face into how little power he has in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see how this relationship at the casino works, uh, uh, you know, against Lionel. I can't imagine what CeCe might do to him, but, and we'll see what happens to Brick if uh, some of uh, Dylan's fraudulent uh, things come to light and Brick's somehow still associated with him. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and we might also see, you know, Mason did give Amy a warning, which is actually mentioned in this episode, as mm -hmm. she and Brick are trying to decide whether to take this offer, that, you know, CC will definitely use Brick in some way, so it'll be interesting to see if, if that warning plays out in some way. Mm -hmm. At Stanford, the doctor tells Eden that Kirk's chances will be really good if they can only find a donor heart. Um, he says he will be under the care of the doctor for the rest of his life, though. So that's a good point. And then Kelly shows up in Stanford to tell Eden she's having second thoughts about marrying Nick. And uh, they have uh, the full discussion that you might expect. Um, meanwhile, Nick thanks Rick and Amy for the brooch they gave uh, Kelly yesterday. And so they say, oh, you... Guys are very disorganized. We gave you crystal glasses, which Cece had previously been admiring for their quality. Uh, so Nick says, oh, Rosa's very organized. Let's figure this out. He finds the gift and the card is with it. And he realizes the brooch was from Dylan. Kelly returns and tells him she's been lying to him. And he says, oh, I know all about the brooch. And Kelly says, there's so much more and it's much worse. Eden returns and tells Cece that there might not be a way. And, you know, during this uh, scene with uh, Kelly and, and um, Nick, which is actually the scene, I think, that, that ends the show this week, um, I kept thinking, well, Kelly kept saying, oh, there's so many lies, so many lies. And I kept thinking, well, there's not really that many. He already knows about the brooch. So the only other two are about her buying the books and about her slipping with Dylan, mm -hmm. which are both pretty big, but, you know, he was already in some ways um, way back um, a bit suspicious about what had happened between her and Dylan. Mm -hmm. And the books thing I'm sure would really, really hurt his ego, but, you know, it was something she could say she was honestly doing for him. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't think of any other lies. I just feel like Dylan's really gotten into her head somehow about this. Yeah, I will see how Nick reacts. Because I also think um, re really Dylan's the only one who would hold this over her, mm -hmm. any of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess once this happens, uh, I mean, if they do break up, I think Dylan will still think, oh, now I've got my chance with Kelly. And still try to date her yeah and i don't think um you know everyone else kind of likes nick and nobody really likes dylan at this point so <laughs> i don't think um they would there would be anyone in the family who would be gunning for a kelly <laughs> dylan dylan <Bear>. relationship <laughs> Um, Pearl tells Amy he's got the day off and is going to the racetrack. And then Madeline arrives to say, oh, I already talked to Cece. He canceled your vacation. You can have another day off uh, next week. So Pearl's a little bit pissed off with Madeline as he takes her back to the bungalow. And we actually see the exterior of the bungalow for the first time. Uh, and uh, 
it's actually right in front of the door that he's parked. Um, so it's not quite on the street as I'd been envisioning it. So, um, and um, as Madeline goes inside, Pearl listens to the races on the radio and uh, makes some bets with his bookie by the car phone. Um, Madeline calls Eden. Uh, this is while she was still up in Stanford, I think. Um, and uh, Madeline says, my thoughts are with you. She hangs up and sees someone approaching her and gasps. Now I thought, oh, maybe David has shown up to surprise her or something at their bungalow only to find that she's with someone else or uh, something of that nature. So but we'll find out quite shortly. Um, as Pearl is uh, listening to the outcome of his race, a woman in a white dress walks past the limo. And I thought, oh, maybe it was maybe it was Courtney that uh, surprised Madeline, you know, and uh, you know, wanted to call her on her her affair. Um, but next time we see the limo, nope, no one's sitting in there. So I thought, oh, maybe it was Courtney. Uh, eventually, Pearl uh, realizes Madeline's gone way over the one hour she said she'd be, and Pearl enters the bungalow to find Madeline dead on the floor, blood pouring from her head, and a hammer next to her. Um, he pushes the hammer away with the back of his hand, so possibly no fingerprints on there, but uh, he tries to call 911 and the phone is not working. As he's checking her pulse, the maid enters and she, uh, he tells her, oh, the phone's not working, run and get the, get the ambulance, but she appears not to speak English and uh, he shouts at her in Spanish, presumably the same thing, but all she does is scream. Most useless maid ever. <laughs> So I feel that uh, Pearl may be suspected of killing Madeline. I think I think that's possible for sure. Um, although I think um, I was thinking about because uh, we're watching Falcon Crest as well, and uh, we've just seen a very similar kind of murder situation on that. Oh, that's, I, I that's think, true. Yeah, I think Pearl is actually being a lot more savvy than the character on Falcon Crest. Yeah. Who Picked up the murder object, <laughs> his hand, and moved it away. So, uh, um, aside from being pissed off at his vacation being canceled, which we're, I'm still not entirely convinced. I mean, I think if I'd been Pearl, I would have gone and, and actually confirmed that with CC. But um, um, apart from that, I just am not sure there would be a lot of reason for for Pearl to be suspected, I mean, motive-wise. So mm -hmm. Yeah, would, oh, yeah, I got my vacation Definitely. canceled. Well, it's not looking good for him, but then again, someone had to find the body and would probably, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. does everyone who finds a body automatically become a suspect? I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know who uh, Madeline was seeing. I mean, if Courtney recognized someone last time, Presumably, it could have been like a politician or something, right? Yeah. I mean, that's other than someone you actually know, that would be the only other type of person you could recognize. So maybe it's yeah. Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I don't specifically remember it being Ronald Reagan, but uh, literally the only thing I remembered about Madeline the whole time on the show was that she, she dies surprisingly early and uh, that she's Courtney's sister. And... Uh, I hadn't even remembered that she was murdered. I had thought, oh, there's going to be a car accident soon. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking in my head, especially when, you know, especially that first time Pearl chauffeured her, I thought, oh, are they going to, is she going to die today? <laughs> is, are they going to get in a car accident on day one? So, um, yeah, so really I have no idea who the murderer is or what it's all about or anything. So I'll be just as uh, intrigued as you. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see. I think uh, Pearl will be. A suspect probably for a, li a little while anyway i think mm -hmm. the case against him or would be stronger if they hadn't found the pearl necklace in um in madeline's purse mm -hmm. so if she had accused him of um of stealing it and you know he had accidentally taken it home with him or something then i think mm -hmm. the case would have been stronger yeah the only other thing i could think is uh you know, if Madeline decided to plant something else in his apartment uh, as part of, you know, a second attempt and, and that gets discovered or something. I feel like that would have been set up in advance, though. 
don't you? Well, yeah, I think so. You would have seen her sneaking around doing something. Yeah, but I mean, I I was kind of looking ahead to see when the actress leaves, and it's not for a little while. So uh, that makes me think we're going to see a lot of flashbacks. Oh, that's possible. The, yeah, you know, so maybe that is a possibility. But I presumably it'll more be more flashbacks as to what she was doing. So. But I assume now maybe Kirk has a heart. Maybe, maybe that's the viper Gina was talking about that would have to donate the heart. No. Uh, I guess Kirk will be back up on his feet Monday morning if that's the case and threatening uh, Haley. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, this is the end of uh, the last week of school for me in 1986. So I would have been studying for studying uh, fruitlessly for finals in uh, statistics 302 and uh, computer science 105, 205, and 305. Um, only one of which I would pass. <laughs> so uh, kind of a wasted semester for me at the SFU. And uh, still haven't uh, gotten a job at Expo. So uh, I'm making plans to move back to Kelowna at the end of April and uh, live for free my parents' house over the summer of 1986 and try to get a job in Kelowna, but not picking any kind of fruit. <laughs> so you would have been finishing 11th grade, was it? 12th. 12th grade. Oh, yeah, we're in 1986. Yeah. yeah. Would have been, uh... Looking forward to provincial exams, which mm. were being run for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, also looking forward to my high school graduation present which was a trip to England oh, my mom. We'll so that's what I'm that looking happens. forward to in the summer um yeah and uh um I think pretty much boycotting convocation at this point because Ooh. relations between myself and some of the organizing committee have deteriorated <laughs> the particulars of a candle lighter ceremony as I recall wow that's exciting. <laughs> Your own Santa Barbara in Pender Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will be back uh, as April continues with episode 100, no, 430. And we will start week 89 of Santa Barbara. We'll see you uh, in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Fools.